Thanks, now you can really hear me. Uh, so a, a young um, uh, monk named Martin Luther uh, uh, had been moved by some of the abuses that were in the Catholic Church at the time. Uh, and uh, he, uh, hi history doesn't actually record it, but tradition says that he nailed 95 debate topics, what were called the 95 theses, 95 debate topics to the church door, the castle church door in Wittenberg uh, on October the 31st, 1517. And um, whether he actually nailed them to the door or not, uh, they were instrumental in uh, sort of opening the floodgates of something which had been brewing for about 200 years. Uh, and um, people were, were becoming more and more frustrated by the distance that Rome had put between them and actual faith and, uh, and the taxation of Rome. The, the indulgences were being sold at the time to pay for the building of St. Peter's Basilica. If you've ever been there in Rome, you know how grand and glorious it is. Uh, it, was being, it was being paid for on the taxation of the peasants of Europe. Uh, and, and people like Martin Luther didn't think that was right. And so he wrote these 95 topics and said, anybody want to debate me on these about the, the rightness or wrongness of indulgences? And guess what? Nobody did. Nobody responded at first until it was discovered that he'd put this document on the castle church door and an ambitious young printer who had just set up the very first printing press because as you might know, something that had just happened 40 years before was that a man named Gutenberg had invented the printing press. This young person decided, I need something to print. So he took Martin Luther's 95 theses, put them in movable type, and started printing copies of it. And within a month, the 95 theses were being found in Spain and in, uh, uh, down in Jerusalem, in fact, and all, all around the, uh, the uh, civilized world. These 95 theses were, were being passed around. And finally, they came to Rome and something had to be done. And so Rome sent an emissary to debate Luther on these topics. And that triggered what we know as the Protestant Reformation. And that's what we're gonna talk about right now. You'll be happy to know I'm not planning on giving you a history lesson. That was the whole, that was the whole history lesson, so um, that's as far as I can go with it. See, I can't, I can't stand back and say why the worldwide church today needs reformation. Uh, 500 years ago, it, it took somebody with the uh, understanding that Martin Luther had to say why the church in his day needed reformation. Uh, and, and you know, uh, Luther was not the first and he wasn't the last and lots of other people got involved in it. Uh, but Luther kind of triggered this whole thing. So I can't stand here and say why the worldwide church needs reformation. That's way above my pay grade. What I can do is I can say why this church needs reformation. Why does this church need reformation? And I want you to turn to Romans 12 and we're going to go very quickly, I hope, through, the, uh, through this. And yeah, the, the uh, service worship time actually began around 10 o'clock, and our, uh, our whole process is thrown off. And if you have a roast in the oven, it's going to burn, and, and whatever. <laughs> That's life. Romans 12, starting at, at uh, verse 1. Because I think there are several reasons why the, this church needs reformation. First of all, uh, because we're the church incarnate. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, it, Paul says, says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, 
by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And this is your spiritual worship. Uh, we're, we're designed, the church is designed to incarnate Christ into the world. Uh, his, he's not here in physical form anymore. Uh, since his ascension, that job has fallen to the church. And so we're, we're supposed to be the very embodiment of Jesus in the world. And so we need to learn how to do something for people that he did. Or I should say to model something that he did. Because in most literal terms, he's the only one who does it. But he expects us to, who, who claim to follow him, he expects us to model it. And that is what a living sacrifice is. When Jesus hung on the cross, he sacrificed himself for others. And that's the model that he expects for the church. And so we're, we're to be a sacrifice. The church incarnate is to behave as a sacrifice for what I want to call the church visible. The difference between the two is that the church incarnate is all of those who are in Christ, the church visible, may be the many more people who wander into, in and out of our presence at any, any given time. So on a regular Sunday morning, there are gonna be people in the room, and I know there are here this morning, people in the room who have not yet made their peace with God. We welcome you. We hope that you stay. We want you to be among us. Because how else are you going to hear? How else are you going to come to the knowledge of Christ unless you hang in, unless you listen, unless you watch? But we have a responsibility in that. We, who are the church incarnate, have a responsibility to incarnate Jesus, to, to be the body of Christ in the world and in the presence of others. So that's one of the reasons why this church needs reformation. Paul says in Colossians 2, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not yet seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. See, Paul wants them to be engrafted. Paul wants the church visible to be engrafted into the church incarnate to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's not enough that we say it. We've got to do it. We have to be it. Second, we are the church transformative. Now, we've just been through our, our seven guiding values, and, we, and one of the central values that we upheld and that we think is really important is transformation. The church is forever renewing. The church is forever reforming. That's the, the lesson that Martin Luther and his gang taught us. And down through the years, there have been so many different examples of the church reforming, of reformation. That to talk about the one great reformation is kind of like talking about the economy and saying, well, there was only ever one recession. We call that the Great Depression. Well, you know that's not true. <laughs> you know that, that the economy rises and falls, and, and periodically you get a pretty big blip, and, and you say, ah, that's a depression. You know. Well, the church has that same kind of undulating pattern. And so the church always needs to be in reformation. But every once in a while, every 500 years or so, let's say, you go, ah, that's reformation. That's the, the worldwide church reforming. But individual churches need to be doing this all the time. So look at what he says in verse 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what begins in one's mind must then work itself out in one's actions. The reforming church doesn't act like it did 50 years ago. This church doesn't behave the way it did 50 years ago or 10 years ago. The church is constantly reforming. 
We know the will of God, he says, when we test that. When we test the transformation God has in mind. Now, how do we test it? Well, you know, when, when Paul came to Christ, when, when Paul first became a Christian, the apostles who were centered at Jerusalem, we, went, we just finished going through the book of Acts this summer, the apostles who were centered at Jerusalem didn't believe it at first. They were like, really? That guy? The guy who was persecuting Christians? The guy who, who had papers, you know, from the Sanhedrin who was going to go and he was going to bring them bound in chains? That guy is preaching Christ? I've seen that happen to whole churches over the years. When I visited a church one time and, and I, I was so disappointed, I, I was like, wow, you know, the, the whole teaching is way off. The church is just not teaching anything I recognize as, as Christian. And then I, 10 years later, I, I just happened to, to go into the same congregation and it may not have increased in size, but all of a sudden I'm like, this church has transformed. This church is, is not at all what it was before. And, and I, I, I walk in and I go, something has happened here. And then you listen to what they're preaching and teaching. You listen, you look at the literature they got around the room, and suddenly you're aware, oh, the gospel has come here. They've, they've begun to preach Christ. That transformation has begun to happen to the church. Now, it had to start with at least one individual. And I don't know the whole story of how it started here. But I know that this church has a history now, an established history of preaching Christ. I don't know what it was doing 50 years ago. I wasn't here. But the, the church can test the work that God's doing. And, uh, and here's the central test of it is resurrection. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 20, Paul writes, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now remember uh, our study in Acts. Remember what was going on. The Pharisees had taught that there was resurrection. They, they, they believed in, that the dead were raised. The Sadducees did not believe that the dead were raised. The Sadducees thought the whole thing was, was hooey. But when the Pharisees actually saw a resurrection, they denied it. They said, oh, it, it didn't happen. That's not because we're not prepared for an actual resurrection. We're prepared for theological resurrection. We're prepared for philosophical resurrection. We like the idea of it, but we do not actually believe when somebody is raised from the dead. That tests us too much. When you hear of God doing mighty things in a church, do you believe them? Do you believe what you see? Do you believe that God is doing amazing things here? I haven't seen anyone raised from the dead, although uh, I was uh, shocked, frankly, that Roger lived through the, uh, the operation he had. He had, he had uh, what's called aortic dissection occur. And get this, I, I wish Darcy was still here, because this, so, this is amazing. So. He first had the pain in Enfield. She took him to Rockville, to the hospital there. They got to the hospital in Rockville, and the hospital assessed him for a couple of hour, minutes or hours, I don't know how long it was, and then they sent him by ambulance to Hartford. And at midnight, I, what time did Roger start having the pains? Two hours, Roger started uh, No, 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 when he, when he first started, when he was at home, when did he first start having the pain? Monday afternoon, evening? Oh, the prep, yeah, he was going to have a, a procedure, right. So, so it, he starts taking this, this uh, preparatory stuff, and he starts having pain. And the, the pain wouldn't subside, and so she finally takes him down to Rockville Hospital. They take him on to Hartford Hospital. It was midnight. 
before they got an operation going. And he lived through it. It's a nine hour operation. It's amazing. You, you don't think God was involved in that? You don't think God saved Roger? I think he did. I think something amazing happened. We test the work of God. We say, that's something God did. Jesus is transforming the world through us, and when the world becomes transformed by the church, that's when you start talking about resurrection on a big scale, when you talk about reformation on a big scale. So we are the church incarnate. We are the church transformative. We're also the church receptive. We're receivers of gifts. Paul says that the grace of God was given to him and then he says that grace is given to each of us in Ephesians 4. But grace was given to each according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to people. And he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. You don't think reformation is happening in a church where those gifts are being expressed, absolutely it is. And the, the reformers of the, of the 1500s, they had a word for that, it's a Latin term, soli gratia. Soli gratia means by grace alone. We're saved only by grace. We don't deserve this. We, there, there's no reason why this little church ought to have all the gifts that we've got. It's amazing. Paul is quick to add that none of us can say, I, this is of my doing. Titus 3 for, uh, verse 4 says, but when the good goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal, reformation through the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ. And then Paul talks about the measure of faith in Romans, according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Uh, I think that's in verse 3. And that's another old 1500s term, sola fide. Only by faith are we saved. Now you may say, well, I only have a little faith, or... I'm just learning to trust God. Or I don't trust God at all. I, I, I don't know how to trust God. That's okay. That's what the church is for. Paul says in the next verse in, uh, in Ephesians uh, 4.13, the passage I just read, that, that God distributed the gifts of the body until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, until we attain, attain mature personhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, the church has faith. The church causes faith to well up in you. And right now you may not feel like you got a lot of faith. Right now you may be someone who's sitting there as a complete questioner. That's okay. You come among us. You're the church visible. And you know what? One day you may be the church incarnate. One day you may do the same thing Jama did and say, this is how I received Christ. This is how I came to Christ, because of somebody else's faith. I have faith. How do we know God's grace? How do we know the measure of faith? You know, the PCC statement of faith that we read earlier for this church says, we claim as our own the faith of the historic church expressed in the ancient creeds and reclaimed in the basic insights of the Protestant reformers. Well, what, what did the Protestant reformers of the 15 and 1600s tell us? What were they trying to reform? They were trying to reform a church that was teaching that, that uh, one is saved by works. We'll sell you this indulgence and it'll get you out of purgatory for 10 or 15 years. You make an offering and, and the priest will pray for you and then you'll be in better standing with God. And Luther and his 
friends in the 1500s said, no, it's only by grace that you're saved, not by your works. It's only by faith that you're saved, not by your works. That's the basic insight of the Protestant reformers. They, there were three other things that they added to that. The first was that it's only through scripture alone that we are, are given the knowledge of salvation. The second is that it's only through Christ alone that we're saved. And the third, it's only and all to the glory of God when we're saved. We've been talking a lot about our vision and values this fall. Anything and everything that we decide to do as a church must have as its underlying and highest goal the glory of God, faith in Christ, through grace alone, by faith alone. So when we proclaim Christ, are we doing it to the glory of God? When we worship, are we doing it to the glory of God? When we transform, are we being changed from glory to glory by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God? When we pray, are we praying for the glory of God? When we give, are we giving in order to glorify God? When we mobilize, are we moving in order to glorify God? When we serve, are we serving in order that we might glorify God? That's the question that every church needs to ask whenever it begins to move. Paul in Colossians 3, 17 says, and whatever you do in, the, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So when you get up in the morning and you go into the bathroom and you brush your teeth, you look in the mirror. It's not, I'm not saying you brush your teeth to the glory of God. There's not, no right way to do that. Okay. But when you, when you look in the mirror, can you honestly, do you honestly say to yourself, I'm going to live this day for the glory of God because of faith in Christ? I want to glorify the Father this day. Not I want to work my way to salvation. I've already got that. I just want everything I do to glorify God. When you go to work, I know, I know where Bill works. I've been to his office. When, when you sit down in, at, at work, or when you sit down with a client, you, you go out traveling, or when you sit in the church office, you know, or, when, or when you're looking at prospects, he's a salesman, or when, what is it you do, Patty? <laughs> you, you, yeah, you're retired. Okay. When, 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 you, when you do whatever you want, are you, well, you know, what Saint, uh, actually, St. Augustine said, love God and do as you please. He must have been retired at the time. <laughs> do, you, do we do those things because we want to glorify God? Our members, not, our, our, our members, do all different kinds of things. We're not one, and that brings me to the next thing, we're not one kind of person. We're also, the fourth thing, we're the church diverse. One size doesn't fit all, but God's going to work the same work through all of us. So for as in one body we have many members, and the members don't all have the same function, right? Our members don't have all the same gifts. It would be awful if all of us were singers. Might make a great noise, but where would be the administrators? It'd be great if, if, if all, I suppose, if all of us were administrators, but, but where would be the givers? It'd be great if all of us were givers, but where would be the servants? See, we've, we've got all of that stuff going on all at once. And so our members don't have the same needs. They don't have the same level of education. They don't have the same ability to trust God. They don't have the same history. And that's why it's so critical that any church be multi-generational, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-economic, and all the rest of the multis I could think of. And yet one body in Christ. Our diversity is our strength. We, we make a mistake if we boil diversity down to having no disagreements. 
you know, and how to handle disagreements. Oh, we're, we're diverse. We have disagreements. We don't agree on everything. That's not the kind of diversity that, that Jesus expects. In fact, I could demonstrate to you from the scriptures, and I don't have the time, that Jesus actually does expect the church to be able to move as one, to be able to make decisions as one. We should be a church that when we get to actually sitting down and having to vote on something, that by that time, we've come to unity. The fact is that Christ expects it of us. And I can show you very quickly, here's, here's the reason why. Can you imagine, because he's just modeled for us, he's just said that the church is like the body, right? Can you imagine uh, what would happen if I decided to go this way and my left hand decided to go that way? Ready? Here we go. Right? I'd completely fall apart, wouldn't I? A church that can't agree on anything can't move. A church that can't agree on anything can't, doesn't have the ability to exercise the vision that's been given to it. The church needs reformation so that we can be that body. Finally, the fifth thing, we're, we're the church restorative because God brings the message of salvation through us. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. It's the only way we're one body. You can become a part of any club you want to and you don't have to be like everyone else. You don't have to be like everyone else here, but you do have to be part of a body. You have to be willing to move with the body together. And we here hold membership very loosely. We don't emphasize joining all that much. We figure that if you're here, God sent you to us, and that's about it. Together, we'll discover why God sent you through the door. The minute that you walk through the door on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening or whenever the church is gathered, you become a part of that church visible I was talking about, part of what I can see when I scan the room. I'm going to treat each person as somebody who belongs here because God put you here. I'm not going to ask questions about why you're here. But the church restorative, the church that brings the salvation of God through Jesus Christ, the church on mission and the church that knows it's on mission, that's quite a different thing. If we're going to talk about who has covenanted with us all through Jesus Christ, if we're going to talk about who is in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, by, and, and who is in Christ through God the Father. That's a different thing altogether. And, and when it matters, I have to know somehow, I have to know who's got my back and whose back I've got. That's why the church needs reformation. I can't stand back and say why the worldwide church needs a reformation. That's way above my pay grade, like I said. What I can say is why PCC needs reformation, we, why we constantly need to reform. We're not a generation away from need for real change. We're not five years away from the need for real change. We're forever, forever, from 1841 until this minute, this church is forever five minutes away from the need for real change. Because it is the human nature to get complacent, to just sit and relax and say, well, I've got that handled. So I've got a question for you for application. Four words. On this Covenanting Sunday, on this Reformation Sunday, 2017, the 500th anniversary of the, Reform the Reformation, ask yourself this, write it down if you can. Am I all in? Am I, am I all in? Have I covenanted with God? Have I been restored to a relationship with God? Am I all into that? Am I also all in for the reformation that God is moving in this congregation? Am I all in? I don't mean... Did you say the words of our covenant? Did you say our statement of faith? Did you say our code of ethics? 
We read them when we have a covenanting Sunday to remind ourselves. What I mean is, are you all in for what Christ is doing with and through PCC? And if you are, expect Reformation to be constantly pouring over you the transformative work of the Holy Spirit, because that's what he's going to do. Reformation pouring over you the transformative work of the Holy Spirit. Our faith makes it possible. Our covenant, our code of ethics demand it. And the health of the body and the progress of your faith and mine depends on it. That's why this church needs reformation and needs it always. All right. Thank you, Jesus.